Okay. Hey, it's John Reed. I've commandeered a, a broom closet, basically, and I've turned it into a podcast studio. I'm joined here at SAP Controlling 2015 with Gary Kokens, who happened to be the keynote speaker. Very interesting keynote. Thank you very much. And you're not an SAP guy, but you fit in well here because you were talking a lot about things that people are passionate about in terms of analytics and predictive. But your calling card is enterprise performance management or corporate performance management. Take your pick. And you're an internationally recognized expert in that field, actually, with books to your credit and everything else. So tell us about what that actually means. Well, John, there's a lot of confusion and lack of consensus about what enterprise and corporate performance management is, and they're synonymous. Uh, most view it uh, as uh, very narrowly as a CFO initiative with a bunch of dashboards. It's, it's much broader. Um, the good news is this. Enterprise performance management, corporate performance management is not a new um, system or process that people have to learn, but rather it is the integration of existing methods that many are already familiar with, like strategy maps and the balance scorecard with KPIs, like uh, product channel customer profitability using activity-based costing principles, like the move from the annual budget to driver-based rolling financial forecasts, uh, like Lean, like Six Sigma. All of these moving parts basically all somehow fit together. The problem is most organizations implement them in isolation or uh, in a sequence. Uh, and like it's if you got a project team in one building and a project team in another building, like they're in parallel universes and you get a lot more power and synergy when you integrate them like gears in a machine and even more power when you embed analytics into them of all flavors like correlation, segmentation, clustering, uh, regression and the like. So it's really, a, it's the integration of methods. And many of these methods have been around for decades, arguably even before computers. <laughs> and do you find that there's increasing interest in this topic now? Well, as I just said, you know, these methods have been around for, you know, years. Why is there interest is your question. And I look at it that there's a bunch of forces that have caused interest. One of them is um, the frustration of executives to execute their strategy. Uh, executives are pretty good at formulating strategy. They'll bring in high-end consulting firms. The big frustration is failure to successfully execute. And there's a fair amount of evidence, uh, CEO turnover rates really at all time uh, record. So board of directors are pretty much uh, not tolerant as much uh, right. with uh, um, uh, failure to implement. And so that's led to the methods of the strategy met the balance scorecard. Another um, force is increased accountability. Today in organizations, there's no place to hide. People are going to be monitored and measured. It doesn't mean their job is at risk, but it's going to certainly impact their promotability. Another force is much more rapid decision making. Unlike five or 10 years ago, you could test and learn and have meetings and conference rooms. Today, people will be on the phone, go or no go, yes or no. It means they really need to know what would the executives do if they were sitting in my chair. Another force is mistrust of the management accounting system. A lot of the line managers don't really trust the numbers uh, that the accountants produce. They know that they may reconcile and pass the out, outside audit, but when it comes to allocations, they know that these allocations are pretty misleading and therefore products are either overcosted or undercosted. Another force is um, really the shift from being product-centric to customer-centric. Um, yeah, my view is that today customers view all suppliers basically as commodities. I mean, I may be over-exaggerating, but, you know, banks all have the same kind of, you know, services and products. So what suppliers really have to do today is provide differentiated services to different types of customers. And that means there has to be much more visibility of understanding, you know, how profitable are different types of customers because sales volume is not necessarily reflective of the level of profitability because you have high maintenance customers and low maintenance customers and the like. And another big hitter is the budget. The annual budget, in my mind, is really almost broken. It's uh, pretty much obsolete in a couple of months after it's produced and um, has a lot of other flaws that are involved with it. And so there is a move towards what's called driver-based rolling financial forecasts. And I'll end on this one. I think there is sort of um, a challenge about the ROI from implementing large-scale CRM or ERP systems. Um, and I'm not trying to take cheap shot at the ERP uh, software vendors, but um, when, okay. you, <laughs> when you, um, I think, would ask, uh, a CIO after they spent several years implementing a large ERP system, how satisfied are you that it met or exceeded the ROI that the salesman uh, promised you? Many would say, well, I'm not really sure. Well, the point is it's important to implement those ERP systems. It's just that the 
ROI is latent. It's in that data. It's like seeds in the ground and what these enterprise performance man management and corporate performance management methods do is it releases the ROI through better decisions and insights. And that brings us to analytics, which I recently described as the most full of BS of any <laughs> topic that's currently hyped in the enterprise software market. But is there a grain of value in there somewhere? What's your take on all that? Oh, yeah. Well, my undergraduate is, is operations research and, and industrial engineering. So I, I've always been uh, analytical. Um, I think analytics is going to be the ultimate competitive edge. I think that if you really look at the cr classical, traditional generic strategies uh, written by uh, some of the famous faculty like Michael Porter at the Harvard Business uh, School, such as to be low cost, low pr price uh, provider like a Walmart or to be a early adopter like uh, like an Apple with the, the Mac and the iPod and so forth, or, or another strategy generic focusing on a narrow a customer segment like a Tiffany's for high-end jewelry. I think those are all vulnerable. Um, I don't think they can be sustained because competitors, for example, can come in quick, quickly and lower their costs using agile techniques that just didn't exist five or ten years ago. Um, other competitors can come in and invade your niche. Look at Amazon. They started off as basically, you know, selling books and then it was selling all sorts of other stuff. And now they're in a cable TV, you know, it's just amazing. So I think, and maybe it's not a strategy, but I think to really have long-term success, you need capability and skill sets for analytics, a culture for analytics inside organizations. So I, I think uh, there, there may be hype about big data and what have you, but I think uh, analytics is really going to be a source of a competitive mm -hmm. advantage. And do you make a distinction as far as predictive? Because predictive sort of the phrase du jour as far as the sort of shift from maybe looking more historical to start thinking about anticipatory. Do you, do you make a distinction there, and do you, how do you see this evolving? Well, no, I actually make a distinction, and, and I think, you know, it, it goes sort of from descriptive analytics, which is looking backwards um, kind of to um, – more like the business analytics, diagnostic analytics, which is still looking backwards, you know, outliers, uh, for example. Then you move to the predictive analytics, which is now the future coming at you, uh, gaining insights and foresights. And there's actually a fourth stage at the high end of the continuum, which is very embryonic, which is prescriptive analytics, which is optimization, which where whereas predictive analytics, you tend to do scenario analysis, change a a independent variable and see how things shift, change the independent variable a little bit more, see how things shift, do sensitivity analysis. Prescriptive analytics says, forget it, bring in the computer, do a linear program and tell me what's the best of all the options. <laughs> so the, the artificial intelligence essentially helping you to actually make a decision, actually making a recommendation. And that's another aspect of analytics, which is the move towards automated decision rules. But that's going to be you know, further. Well, it's not really that far off in the future. For example, a customer sales rep are on a on a on a phone call. You know, the inbound telephony system may recognize who is that customer, and, and then it's well, what offer dealer or a discount or coupon should I offer them? Well, in the past, it may be you know let that customer rep kind of use their own thinking, well, in the future, it's going to be some sort of, you know, data scientist will have already done all the equations and algorithms and the customer rep will just read the screen and say, this is the exact amount to offer. But, but Gary, do you really think that the typical enterprise customers are, are ready for this? I mean, I talked to some of the people that are at this conference and they seem to be a little bit overwhelmed by the data that they're dealing with, much less even thinking about some of the new sources around you know, weather or, or geopolitical information, whatever it is that's going to guide those decisions for them. Are customers ready? And are, are you the kind of person that, like, talks with them about how to overcome these stumbling blocks to get there? Or? Well, I think just like in any, you know, new or just the, the whole model of leaders and laggards, you've always got that distribution yeah, curve, yeah, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, analytics is definitely the new kid on the block. And so, you know, you have... Uh, some leaders. I think the more interesting question is, you know, what will accelerate the adoption rate of analytics? How do you create that culture yeah. for analytics? And there's a lot of debate 
Um, in fact, even at this conference, uh, some have thought that, oh, well, the CFO may be the best one to drive the uh, analytics because they're already so analytical. And I don't share that opinion. I think the and I think the CFO and the finance function is five or 10 years behind other functions such as marketing and uh, supply chain management. Marketing is really amazing. I mean, they really have grabbed the ball and, um, you know, know so much information because they have access to a lot of big data. Uh, Social sentiment analysis and all kinds with of With the stuff. Senate, well, that's the unstructured data. There's yeah. that. But just even having, uh, I used to use an example of a retailer that's got, you know, cash registers or whatever, uh, point of sale terminals almost in real time, every store throughout the United States. And they match that up with their customer master file and who they are, what did they bought in the past, where do they live, what gender are they. And they can just figure out so much to get uh, that next buy offer uh, or the other example of, well, geez, we know customers that bought A and B, uh, and then they also bought C. Well, let's look for customers that only bought A and B and haven't bought C, and then we'll basically give them an offer and deal because it's likely we can get that lift. That's deep analytics. And you have a, a book that has a, a chapter on predictive that's actually free on, on Amazon. <laughs> chapter one is free. It's Chap chapter one, I should be clear. It's uh, Predictive Business Analytics. I co-authored it with Larry Maisel. And uh, yeah, I always tell people, go to go to the Amazon and get, or even to the Wiley, the uh, publisher. Chapter one's free, uh, 15 pages, because it's a really quick primer, and most people don't have the patience to read a, a full book. So what would they take from the first chapter? Well, I think it starts clarifying um, that there's value in analytics, both looking back and forward. I What bothers me sometimes when I see presentations oh, at the rear view mirror and people say, don't drive the car through the rear view mirror, we drive the car through the windshield. I say, well, yeah, you know, you're underestimating how much inferences can be gained just by looking at historical information patterns and the like. But clearly, the real higher value is going to be the predictive view, the future view. All decisions are made in the future. It's, I'm just, my point I'm making, though, is you gain some understanding about what the future is going to be like somewhat by looking at the past. Right. So if you're a company that that isn't what you would call a leader, but doesn't really want to be a laggard and, and wants to move ahead with this, uh, what what are some of the things that you would advise a company to do? Are you thinking in terms of like solidify the enterprise uh, performance management function. I, I know a lot of companies would love for you to buy their enterprise performance management software, and that's going to flip a switch. Or are there deeper cultural problems that need to be addressed? Like, what do you think companies should do that want to get on this thing? Well, I mean, change management is really the name of the game, and I think everybody's beginning to recognize that. You know, the technology is no longer the impediment that it was many years ago. The tools are so powerful. In fact, most. Most users don't use, you know, the, much of the or all of the features and functions that are in software packages. And th there's a couple of aspects to this. One, it's it's really about overcoming resistance to change, and 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 uh, that's human nature. People like the status quo, but there's other issues. People are concerned about others knowing the truth and being measured and being held accountable. You know, this kind of stuff's got nothing to do with technology. It's all about people, and few of us are really sociologists or psychologists. We're going to learn a little bit more about change management. One technique I've sort of relied on the last few years in, in contrast to trying to hype, oh, this is why things are so great, is actually to create discomfort. Um, we really step back to overcome resistance and, and don't underestimate the magnitude of resistance. You really need a couple of things in abundance. And one is discomfort with the, dis, with the current state. Unless people are dissatisfied, quite frankly, they're not going to basically move. Then you have to provide them a vision of what better look like. And a lot of people start with, oh, here is the great, you know, new shiny toy. And I'm saying, so I do try to introduce discomfort. You know, do people understand the executive strategy? Do you know where you make or lose money? Do you have a good forecast of the future? And when you've got those kind of uh, you know fear, uncertainty, and doubt, people will start thinking about what's the solution? Do you know who your profitable and your demon customers are? <laughs> Another good one, right? All, all of those, you know, all of those questions. But I mean, it can be career limiting if you start asking these questions of, you know, some of the higher level executives who may be defensive. And that brings up another, I think, critical, uh, I don't know if it's a requirement about how to really get uh, the culture. And I'll just put it this way. I think in the past, the best executives, and the best leaders had the best answers. Today, I don't think that's the case. I think the best leaders and executives have the best questions. There is no way, given all the volatility and uncertainty 
uh, and change that's going on that executives can rely on their gut feel or intuition or their past experiences that got them promoted to the levels that they're at today that they can rely on in the future. And that really means they've got to create a culture for questions and discovery and investigation. And that really gets to the heart of analytics. It's all about understanding. And I would also include a tolerance for making mistakes. I mean, you're never going to be always correct and uh, there should no be penalties. It's a lot of trial and error. Now, there's interesting technology within memory. Um, I can share with you, having been with an analytic software vendor till I retired a few years ago, I'm 66 now, um, the, the power analysts really prided themselves on format formulating and framing the problem because it took such a long time to run the thing, you know, control group and so forth. And, uh, but today within memory, it's almost like uh, speed of speed of thought. You can test and learn and do another mistake and move very quickly. So technology and in memory is, is going to change the game in terms of analytics. Yeah. And I noticed that was interesting because in your sessions, I was wondering how much you would sort of plug or comment on SAP technology. Cause obviously Han is their big in memory solution. And, I like what you said. You you sort of stepped back from that and talked about technologies and an an enabler, right? So it's not necessarily which technology you pick. It's it's how it fits into your overall approach that, that counts the most. Yeah, as well, and not only that, you know, which type of statistical technique applies to which method? I mean, I've already rattled, rattled off four popular ones, regression, correlation, clustering, segmentation. You know, you don't apply them, you know, to each one of them. It's going to basically right. be, be, be customized or tailored. One more thing I want to ask you. I went to your activity-based costing session, and you're a firm believer in the power of, of doing it that way and doing it right. Um, but I also picked up on a little bit of frustration in the sense that you were saying kind of why the heck hasn't this thing been more broadly understood or adopted? Is that sort of one of your kind of missions in this part of your career is to really turn the corner on that or? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, it's not just only activity based costing, which incidentally is a, a form of tracing, uh, expenses to product channels and, and, and customers proportionately not using these broad brushed averages that the accountants kind of get lazy and uh, use. They, they reconcile in total, but it's but another way of identifying. It's another way of helping to identify the profitable customers and different things like that. Yeah, it's just yeah. truly understanding your cost and what drives it and visibility yeah. and transparency and all that goes with it. But I mean, this can be applied, as I even mentioned, whether it's to analytics or any type of new innovation or new methodology or new anything that's that's coming out. It's just, it seems to take a long time um, for the adoption. And so I'm trying to think, how do you basically, you know, move faster? I, I've sort of moved towards what I call MBE, management by embarrassment, <laughs> and <laughs> which has been sort of part of this call, which yeah. is, you know, uh, almost call people on, put them on the carpet and say, you know, I think you may be irresponsible here. You are denying managers to have access to information that uh, will provide the organization to be more effective. And right. I'm all about managers. You know, let me just say something about analysts. I think what analysts, and I'm going to bring IT into this, I think what analysts want is really two things. They want easy and flexible access to the data and the ability to manipulate it. And I'll repeat that. They want easy and flexible access to the data and the ability to manipulate it. Problem is there tends to be a wall between the user analyst and IT because IT basically is back there kind of service provider worried about governance. And these are all valid things. And that wall needs to come down. And I think, and it's not a finger pointing game. They're right. both involved in this thing. And I think self-service ability to do analytics is increasingly going to be the future. Excellent. I think that's a good note to end on. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Happy Appreciate to be it. here. Thanks, John.